Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here uh, tonight, see old friends and new. Happy to have escaped the Boston weather for a few days. <laughs> uh, many thanks to Peg for inviting me and to all of you for coming out. Happy birthday to Molly Giles and Lori Austin. <laughs> I'm going to read the end of a chapter in my novel. The cast of characters are Hannah Schutt, her, the narrator, her husband Joe, their college-age daughter Dawn, Dawn's boyfriend Rudd Petty, and a police detective named Kenneth Thornburg. There's a reference to Joe and Hannah's other daughter, whose name is Iris, and there's a reference to time in the final paragraph. <laughs> The other reference to time I will make is that jet lag hit me upside the head at 11.30 this morning, so I hope this is coherent. Uh, the scene takes place the day after a Thanksgiving filled with tension because Joe, in particular, doesn't like or trust his daughter's boyfriend, Rudd. Hannah and Dawn have gone Black Friday shopping, and Joe makes an excuse to go to his office because he doesn't want to be alone with Rudd. They all return home to discover that they've been robbed, and they call the police. Suspicion turns to Rudd, of course, because he was the only one in the house at the time. Several hours after this scene, Joe will die in a vicious attack, and Hannah will be severely beaten. Rudd is convicted of the crimes, although when the novel opens, he has won a new trial based on appeal. And I'll pick up just after Kenneth Thornburg has taken Rudd, the boyfriend, aside to question him. The detective told us Mr. Petty says something of his is missing, too. Apparently, his camera was stolen, along with all your property. His tone made it clear that he did not believe what Red had told him. I don't remember seeing any camera, Joe said, as we watched Rudd walk over to Dawn and put his hands on her shoulders. He said, really, Mr. Shutt? You didn't see me yesterday after dinner, taking pictures of the birds out there? He pointed to the yard. There was that gorgeous cardinal, remember? I must have shot a whole roll. Same smile on his face, same charm in his voice as during the rehearsal dinner before Iris's wedding when I fell for it all. Only this time I was aware of the duplicity behind it. There had been no camera, no photographing of birds in the backyard. That never happened. <laughs> Joe shook his head, looking at Rudd with a smile I'm sure he didn't even realize was there. Knowing my husband as I did, I could tell that as angry as he was about Rudd having robbed us, he also felt fascinated by the arrogance it took for him to lie about it. I set the camera right down there on top of the hutch, Rudd said, and now it's gone. They must have gotten that too. They, the fictitious burglars who, having noticed someone in the house and probably the dog as well, still chose to enter in broad daylight and search for valuables before removing those items and restoring order behind them. Rudd turned to Dawn and said, I know you remember, kitten. You said you couldn't remember seeing anything so red as that little birdie. I watched my daughter freeze for a moment, just a moment, no one but a mother would have caught it, before she turned her face up to him, her features brightening conscientiously along the way. Of course I remember, she agreed, but she could not look at Joe and me. It was clear that the detective understood what was going on. But as Joe and I walked him out to the driveway, he told us that with Rudd reporting himself as a victim too, and no actual evidence, there wasn't much the police could do but file a report. You can't search his car, Joe asked. I mean, our daughter's car. Thornburg said hopefully, do you own it? Joe pursed his lips, shook his head. No, it's in her name. Then she'd have to consent. Joe turned toward the house and called for Dawn. In a moment, she appeared, trailing Rudd behind her with her hand locked in his. What now? Something had changed in her expression, even in the short time since we'd left them alone in the house. Her features were hardened against Joe and me, as if Rudd had whispered a promise she'd been wanting to hear. Would you let the officer take a look in your car? Though I could see that Joe also felt shaken by the shift in our daughter's demeanor, he would not let it deter him. When she hesitated, he added, after all, if there's nothing to hide, there's no reason not to allow a search, right? He was right, of course, and I saw that Dawn wanted to say yes, so she'd have the satisfaction of proving us wrong. 
But that was when Rudd stepped in front of her and said, we are not going to stand here and listen to you accuse us like common criminals. I was taught to respect my elders, but if you want to know the truth, Mr. and Mrs. Shutt, I think you should be ashamed of yourselves. He lifted his chin, and literally standing by her man, Don did the same. I thought about reminding him that nobody was accusing Don of anything, but I recognized it as one of those cases that called for restraint of tongue. At that moment, I wished Joe were the type of man who would just say the hell with it and pop the trunk before anyone could stop him, or that I had the courage to do it myself, but neither was the case, and I knew it. Thornburg cleared his throat and told us that if anything changed, we should call him, and he'd let us know if the police came up with any leads. Rudd said to him, you have my number if that camera turns up. And Thornburg, also exercising restraint, it seemed, barely acknowledged the statement before getting into his car. Back in the house, Don said to Rudd, honey, mom made you a sandwich. I hadn't done so, and she knew it, but she offered him the plate I prepared for the detective. Rudd took the plate and set it back on the table with an exaggerated delicacy, as if he considered it contaminated. We won't be staying for lunch, he said. Get our things together, kitten. We're obviously not welcome here. Dawn is most certainly welcome here, Joe said. Until then, Dawn had only looked anxious as we all waited to see how the scene would unfold. But at her father's words, she erupted in tears. How can you do this, she cried, pushing past us to run up to her bedroom, where we heard her packing up their things. Rudd did not move to help her, but pulled a chair out and sat down at the table. Despite his stated refusal to remain in our house for another meal, he picked up the policeman's sandwich and finished it in a few bites, all the while ignoring Joe and me as we stood by watching him, stunned by his nerve. When they drove off a few minutes later, it was without any further words among the four of us. We shouldn't have let them leave, I told Joe. It's snowing, they're angry, and we're not really sure what happened. I was pleading with him to agree with me. Are we? Oh, God, Hannah. I could see that it wearied him to have to insist again upon what we both knew. I was grateful that he didn't invoke our private expression, lacy eye. Yes, for sure. He stood in Rinsbrud's plate as if knowing that I would not want to touch it. He was right. It was the kind of moment I loved him for. Without even talking about it, we decided not to go see Hamlet that night as we planned. We were in no mood for a tragedy. Instead, we stayed in and ordered a movie on cable. I did not remember doing this. When Kenneth Thornburg came to question me in the hospital, I could not tell him anything about the hours leading up to the attack. The last thing I remembered was deciding to call Dawn to make sure she'd gotten back safely to her apartment. I resolved not to mention anything about the robbery so that our conversation wouldn't disintegrate the way the Thanksgiving visit had. I would keep it short and sweet, the checkup call to say, I love you, no matter what. But Dawn wasn't home. Her roommate, Opal, answered and told me she hadn't seen Dawn since Tuesday night. I asked her to have Dawn call me when she got home. But if she did so, I could not remember. At the trial, one of the investigators testified that our cable records showed that Joe and I purchased a movie that Friday at 8.11 p.m. When the prosecutor asked the witness what the movie was, he answered as matter-of-factly as the situation called for, yet the prosecutor allowed a pause before her next question to ensure that the irony was not lost in anyone in the room. Just hours before someone came into our house and crushed our skulls with a croquet mallet, my husband and I had ordered, and presumably watched, Catch Me If You Can. Even the judge raised her eyebrows as a nervous titter bounced off the courtroom walls.